Hi everyone, Professor Howard here. This is Biology 160, Chapter 6, Reproduction at the Cellular Level. Uh, this PowerPoint mostly contains information about mitosis, although there is some mention of some other styles of uh, reproduction at the cellular level as well. So, let's begin. So, organisms that are alive, if they are multicellular, begin life as a single cell, and that divides to form two and later four and later 16 cells, which you can see in the first two images here. So here we can see the cleavage furrow of this particular sea urchin embryo forming. And here you can see at the 16 cell stage, the organism is already exhibiting radial symmetry, meaning that it has multiple axes along which it is symmetrical. And at the end of that, you get a nice, beautiful little spiky sea ball called the sea urchin. So embryological development is inherently a time of lots and lots of mitosis. So we're going to talk about mitosis during this PowerPoint and as well as some other stuff. So let's begin. So checking out some karyotypes here. Remember, karyotypes are a picture of the condensed chromosomes from a cell that's about to divide. So Chromosomes in cells that are in interphase between divisions don't look like this, but if you catch a cell at the right time, you can actually take a picture of its chromosomes and arrange them uh, to look like pictures like this. So it's important to remember that karyotypes, DNA images that are from dividing cells. So here we have a karyotype from dad and one from mom and one from child. So thing is, of this child's DNA, it got one chromosome per pair from dad and one chromosome per pair from mom. So how do you accomplish reproduction if you're going to combine your cells with the cells of another individual, or cell in particular, uh, how do you make it so that the resulting cell, the first cell of your new child, has the same number of chromosomes as you do? Because if I were to combine this person, dad's DNA, and this person, mom's DNA, I would get four chromosomes at each position, right? We don't want that. That's too many chromosomes. So in order to accomplish uh, reproduction, there's a modification that has to be made to mitosis. So mitosis is just for making more cells. Meiosis is specifically for making more cells with half the DNA of a regular cell so that it can be combined with somebody else's gamete. So we'll talk about that more when we get to the meiosis PowerPoint. The amazing thing number two is that the picture of chromosomes in one cell, so each of these karyotypes was made with the chromosomes from one cell, represent a picture of the chromosomes in every single cell of a body made out of gazillions of cells. So your eye cells, your liver cells, your skin cells, your blood vessels, all of these cells have the same DNA in their nucleus. Even though they're very different in their shapes, styles, and functions, they are still genetically identical. Okay, so somatic cell cycle. Let's take a moment to define somatic first. So somatic cells, and this word soma means body. So somatic cells are cells of the body. And you might be thinking, well, all of my cells are cells of my body. Why do we have to have this silly name for it? Um, not all of your cells are considered to be somatic cells. So the sex cells or gametes are the sperm and eggs, and they are not somatic cells. So somatic cells are any cell of the body that is not a sex cell. Okay. So in this image, we see the somatic cell cycle, and this includes a large period of time during which the cell is not actively dividing, and then a short period of time during which the cell is. So the long period of time during which no division occurs is called interphase. So inter means between. So interphase really just refers to the fact that during this time, the cell is between divisions. Then we have the mitotic phase, which includes mitosis, 
and cytokinesis. So mitosis is DNA division, really. So it's the dividing of the nucleus. And cytokinesis is cut cell in half to form two new daughter cells. So these concepts are related, but they're not the same. So mitosis and cytokinesis are not interchangeable terms. They are different, and we'll discuss that a little bit more later. So interphase is divided up into three overarching stages. So there is cell growth that happens during G1. So this is the first one. DNA synthesis, which happens during S. And G2 is more cell growth. So interphase is not all the same. There's different things going on during different points in interphase. So it's appropriate to indent here and say G1, S, and G2. Wow, that's a terrible two. Let me try that again. Two, there we go, are subsets or subphases of interphase. So during G1, the cell is growing, getting bigger, and it's also doing whatever it normally does uh, as a cell. During S phase, S standing for DNA synthesis, the cell has decided that it's going to replicate and therefore it needs to copy all its DNA first. So it takes quite a while to do that because DNA is a long molecule. So S phase is the next step and it takes quite a while. After that, we have gap two. So the G stands for gap. Uh, G2, cell is growing and it's doing all of its cell tasks. So like if it's a liver cell, it's making bile and it's doing liver stuff. But it's doing all that stuff with doubled DNA. So instead of having one copy of each chromosome, it's got two. And once it's ready, and we'll talk about checkpoints in a little bit as well, it will begin mitosis, which is the division of its nuclear DNA, followed by cytokinesis, which is the division of its cytoplasm. And then each of the daughter cells that result from that division will also go into interphase. So here is a picture of mitosis. Um, this is just an overview. So it's a good slide to practice from because you should be able to summarize this information by the end of this PowerPoint. So in overview, during prophase, chromosomes are condensing and the nuclear envelope is breaking down. Also, the nucleolus disappears. During prometaphase, the mitotic spindle, which is made of microtubules, begin to, begins to grow, and those microtubules radiate towards the center of the chromosome. So those are kinetochores uh, where they attach. So the mitotic spindle microtubule is attached to the kinetochores, which are the attachment points at the middle of each chromosome. And the centrosomes move to opposite poles. During metaphase, all of the chromosomes, the duplicated chromosomes, are aligned in the middle of the cell at something called the metaphase plate. During anaphase, the proteins uh, that bind the two sister chromatids together break, and the microtubules pull those chromatids away from each other. Once the chromatids arrive at opposite ends of the poles, then they begin to decondense because, again, that's not how DNA looks in a cell most of the time. <sighs> Excuse me. I tried to pause, but that yawn just kind of took over for a second there. I got up really early to do the elementary school science Olympiad, and so I'm a bit sleepy. By the way, those of you who I saw there, it was good to see you. All right, and then finally, cytokinesis occurs. This is when a cleavage furrow separates two daughter cells. Or, if you are a plant cell, we'll have to talk about that as well, a cell plate separates the two daughter cells. So uh, plant cells and animal cells do that a little differently because there's a cell wall or not. Okay, so let's look at that a little bit more closely, shall we? We've got two cells, a contractile ring of microtubules, is going to polymerize in the middle and then it's going to ratchet down and get shorter. Kind of like, you know how when you uh, reduce the circular area of a zip tie, so when you're like closing a zip tie, it can get smaller but not bigger, so it ratchets down. Same idea with the contractile ring of microtubules here, so it pinches the cell in half. In a plant cell, we have Golgi vesicles. Remember, the Golgi apparatus is like the FedEx of the cell, and the way that it packages products is using vesicles. So in ordinary cell biology, when the cell is not dividing, those vesicles are going to transport things within the cell. 
but it turns out you can also fill them up with precursor ingredients to build a new cell wall and then build a little fence down the middle of the cell. So Golgi vesicles coalesce at the former metaphase plate and then they fuse to form the cell plate. The cell plate basically ends up spanning the two walls and because the vesicles are full of polysaccharides and other plant cell wall materials, the wall is actually made from the contents of the vesicle. So one of the things a plant cell is busy doing during G2 is finishing up making the cell wall ingredients that it's going to package into those vesicles. Okay, so many cells undergo division fairly frequently. So a good example of this is skin cells. Uh, they divide very, very often, so they're kind of always cycling through this. Some cells, however, don't actively divide, so they will leave uh, and enter something called G0. So in some cases, this is a temporary condition until cells are triggered to enter G1, and in other cases, the cell remains in G0 permanently. So um, another thing to note is that scientists are capable of coaxing cells out of G0 and making them go into G1. Uh, but a lot of times when a cell enters G0, that means it's done dividing forever. So G0 just means cell is not preparing to divide and doesn't plan to anytime soon. Okay, so I mentioned cell cycle checkpoints. So consider the following. You are a cell and you want to divide. So you have to make all the proteins necessary for division. And you also have to copy your entire genome, which is lots and lots of chromosomes. And those chromosomes are super condensed DNA, so they're very long. That means that there is a possibility that during those steps, errors can be made. And a cell needs to make sure that it has enough resources and everything is right if it's going to divide. If it's not, it won't divide. So that's what the checkpoints are all about. So starting with the G1 checkpoint, this is to check for DNA damage. So before you even start copying your DNA, you want to say, hey, is any part of this molecule busted in some way? Should we fix it? So that's what the G1 checkpoint is all about. It also is about checking for sufficient resources. So does the cell have enough ATP and other tools to get uh, the DNA copied and get mitosis underway? If not, it needs to acquire some nutrients. Okay, so then we have S phase, and there's no checkpoint inside S phase because there doesn't need to be. The cell is just busy copying its DNA. During the G2 checkpoint, this is right before the mitotic phase, as you can see, during the G2 checkpoint, the cell is going to check the new DNA for damage. So we have two damage checks. One is before the DNA is copied, and the other one is after it's done. And then also check for correct chromosome numbers. So we, we need to make sure that all of the chromosomes were copied, not just some of them, and that none of them were copied twice. Once that happens, then theoretically the cell is ready to enter mitosis. So the last checkpoint we have to worry about is during mitosis, and that is something called the M checkpoint. So the M checkpoint checks that all of the chromosomes are attached to the mitotic spindle. So remember that video I showed you where the chromosome was lost and it took a while for it to get to the metaphase plate? That's an example of the M checkpoint, so you can actually watch that video. So it's basically like a roll call for chromosomes. Okie dokie. So let's move on. So I mentioned that some cells go into G0 and other ones don't. And you may be wondering, okay, so then what controls the rate of t turnover in a cell? And there is a set of genes that are in control of the cell cycle. So those genes are going to control how often the cell divides and either upregulate or downregulate its division depending on the needs of the cell or tissue that the cell is in. So I want to stress that both of these uh, names for things have tumor and onco in them. So these both refer to cancer. Now, the reason I'm stressing this is I want to make sure that you guys understand these aren't genes that cause cancers normally. Uh, so they don't just sit in your genome being sinister and being like, mwahaha, I'm going to give you cancer one day, but rather, these genes were discovered 
during cancer research because something was wrong with them in that particular cancer cell. So the reason that their name stuff related to cancer is more related to their discovery and what happens when you screw them up rather than the fact that they're there specifically to cause cancer. So tumor suppressor genes, these are going to downregulate the rate of division. So they're going to keep division rates low. If you lose those, so if you don't have any genes that actively reduce cell division rate, then you get an increase in cell cycling, and that can lead to cancer. So some examples of these genes, they have really boring names, P53, P21, etc. Proto-oncogenes are the opposite case. So these are positive cell cycle regulators. So they're going to function to increase the rate of division. So if these get mutated in such a way that they gain too much functionality, they're going to basically put their foot on the gas pedal of mitosis. And that's going to increase the rate of uh, cell division potentially to the point of cancer formation. So examples of these are CDK, RAS, Mike, and some viral oncogenes. So let's explain really quick uh, about viral oncogenes just because why not? So viruses use animal cells in order to reproduce. They don't have the ability to make more of themselves on their own. So viruses are little bits of DNA or RNA that hide in your genome uh, and they need to copy themselves. So they use our polymerases and our ribosomes to make more of themselves. So the corollary to that is that although viruses are infectious and they're bad for us, uh, they need us. So they need our cells to be alive or they need a steady supply of live cells in order to keep on making more virus. So it doesn't actually benefit a virus um, to kill its host, at least not in the short term. So instead, some viral oncogenes uh, try to upregulate mitosis so that the cell is not only making more virus, but it's also making more cells for the virus to hijack. Hope that makes sense. Okay, so let's move on from this. So here we have figure 6.8, an example of a tumor suppressor gene. So under normal circumstances, this gene is going to downregulate uh, cell cycle. So DNA damage, cell cycle abnormalities, or hypoxia, which is low oxygen. These are going to damage the cell to the extent that it can't divide. So P53 is activated by these conditions. And that's going to cause the cell either to stop dividing so it can repair its DNA and restart the cell cycle, or if the damage is too severe, uh, the cell may be directed to simply die. So we call that apoptosis. If we have a damaged P53, so something has gone wrong with it, same conditions apply, but they're not going to be able to activate P53 anymore. So in that case, the cell cycle is going to continue with damaged DNA and cells can become cancerous. So that's an example. All right, so mutation and accumulation of cancer. So cancer equals uncontrolled growth of cells. And most cancers are thought to involve multiple mutations that accumulate sequentially. So it's not usually just one single mutation that causes cancer, but rather one happens and that's preserved in the genome. And then there's another one and that's preserved in the genome. And then there's another one and that's preserved in the genome until eventually there are enough mutations that are negative to cause uncontrolled cell growth. So in this picture, we see a tissue made of cells, and those are packed predictably, and they have a constant number. So if one cell dies, another cell will come to replace it. In this picture, this cell is going to incur a mutation in the cell cycle control gene. Uh-oh. And it's going to continue dividing. And it doesn't really care about the rules for division for this tissue. Um, like let's think about epithelium, for example. So if a columnar cell dies, it's going to need to be replaced by another columnar cell. But if that cell's cell cycle control gene has been messed up and some other things about it have been messed up too, it's not only gonna divide a bunch and push its neighbors out of the way, it's probably also gonna have a weird shape. 
So this is what that looks like. So single mutant cells grow a little out of control, probably not noticeably. More divisions equals more DNA replication. And statistically, the more times you replicate your DNA, the higher the chances are that a mutation will happen. So we're increasing our chances of mutation just by the cell cycle control gene being messed up. What if now, due to all that division, we've got a second cell cycle control gene and the growth gets more out of control? So now I can see the green cells are increasing. So this is pretty dangerous, and especially if the tissue happens to be near a blood vessel, because then cancerous cells can hop into the bloodstream and travel elsewhere, which is called metastasis. So metastasis is the movement of cancer from one body tissue to another, and that's to be avoided. So metastatic cancers are the more dangerous kinds of cancers. So when you get double mutants, you get even faster uh, cell division and more rounds of division and replication, which creates even more chances for mutation. So this gets out of control pretty quickly. And here we have a third mutant. And now we have cell growth that is going to add more cells and uh, it's going to exceed the margins of the original tissue. So cancer results, tumor formation, lost, of contact inhibition. So in a lot of cases, a cell will resist contacting another kind of cell so it doesn't move into a particular space it's not supposed to. Um, that's not something you see here. So you can see that these black cells are deciding that they don't care that the tissue is supposed to be shaped like a rectangle. They're just going to do whatever. You also get de-differentiation. So they go from being differentiated into a particular kind of cell to being sort of amorphous blobs. They're no longer capable of undergoing apoptosis and they can even recruit their own blood vessels. So angiogenesis means the cancer is causing the formation of blood vessels to feed it. Yuck. And eventually you get metastasis, which is the movement of cancer from one tissue to another, like I mentioned. All right, so let's look at binary fission in prokaryotes, and then we'll move on to uh, cell division in eukaryotes. So binary fission is really, really simple, and it's a lot simpler than mitosis. Um, prokaryotes have a single circular chromosome, which means that there are two replication forks that go in opposite directions. So basically, the circle of the chromosome unzips from the middle and eventually you get these two rings. This FTSZ protein, which is important, um, this is kind of similar in nature to the uh, microtubules in a um, eukaryotic cell with regard to their role in cell division. So they're kind of distributed evenly throughout the cell in this uh, first rectangle. And then as replication of the chromosome completes, the FTSC proteins migrate towards the midpoint because that's where they're going to need to cut the cell in half. So once the chromosome is completely duplicated and we've got two separate bits of DNA, those are going to continue to move away from each other towards opposite ends of the cell. Meanwhile, the FTSC proteins have now gone from being kind of loosely aggregated at the center of the cell to being a solid ring and those are going to contract. The FTSZ ring directs the formation of a septum that divides the cell as well. So plasma membrane and cell wall materials both accumulate there. The plasma membrane forms first and the cell wall is formed second. So that septum forms um, kind of like how plant cells do it as well. So the take-home message there is that, that if you have a cell wall, you need some extra steps in order to build a new wall barrier as well as build a new membrane. But that's the overview of prokaryotic binary fission. Okay, and that's the end of that one. I realized that that PowerPoint was a teensy bit different than the one I gave you in lecture, and that's okay. Um, the next video I make is going to cover the steps of mitosis, M-I-T-O-S-I-S. -I -I and then after that, I will make the one about meiosis. So thank you for your attention.